Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar on GDPR. I'm Alan Calder. I'm your host for the next hour in which we're going to be looking at the legal obligations and responsibilities on data processes and controllers as set by the General Data Protection Regulation. My background uh, before I founded IT Governance, which we started back in 2005, has long been in business generally, but certainly in cybersecurity and data protection from the late 1990s. Uh, IT Governance grew out of a book I wrote on how to implement a management system in accordance with what is now known as ISO 27001 around the world. Uh, that book's gone on to be the Open University postgraduate textbook uh, for information security management and is used in a bunch of other places. And IT governance has become, it appears, the market leader in uh, GDPR products and training services. As a company, we're a one-stop shop, so we pride ourselves on being able to put together a mix of products and services that enable organizations to tackle their various cybersecurity and compliance requirements in a way that suits them best. So uh, for us, the answer isn't always buy more consultancy. It's we can put together whatever mix of products and services you need to achieve the result that you want in a way that uh, matches the uh, business and cultural style of your organization from PCI and penetration testing all the way through information security, data protection to cyber resilience. We're going to be talking today in GDPR terms about the definitions of data controller and data processor, both of which uh, are now clearly set out under GDPR. The, uh, In particular, the definition of a processor is legally defined for the first time. We'll look at the responsibilities and obligations of controllers and processors and the way data breach reporting responsibilities work. We'll look at the way uh, liabilities are incurred and the way in which those can uh, be affected between controllers and processors. And we'll touch on the business of joint controllers and how subcontracting processes uh, can work together. So quite a complex and fairly uh, legally um, uh, dense webinar today. I'm expecting to talk for around about 45 or 50 minutes. You will have noticed that uh, you're in listen-only mode. Uh, the one question many of you will be asking is, uh, are these slides going to be available? The answer is yes. Uh, the slides will be available uh, and sent out over the course of the next uh, few days. If you find you do have questions that you want to ask as I go through the webinar, please do use the uh, questions function in the GoToWebinar control panel, which you should have on your screen right now. You can type a question into the question box. And when we come to the Q&A session, which will be the last 10 minutes or so of the webinar, I'll then pick up on the uh, questions there are. I'll read the questions out uh, and then I'll provide, uh, assuming that I can, the answer to the question so everybody knows both the question and the answer. And so we're aimed to be finished here by uh, four o'clock uh, British summer time at the latest today. So definitions of data controller and data processor. Uh, first critical uh, components of the uh, regulation. We're going to be looking at the uh, definition also of um, personal uh, personal data and of personal breaches. But the definitions of controller and processor are important because the controller, the entity that's responsible for determining uh, what data is to be collected and how it's to be processed is the key role in the whole of GDPR. If data subjects give up their data, they give it up to a data controller. The controller therefore has obligations to the data subjects and those obligations stretch through to any third party processor that the controller might choose to appoint. Bear in mind that the, um, the timeline for compliance, which is uh, 
now quite short, 25th of May 2018 is the date from which GDPR will apply. It entered into force on the 24th of May uh, 2016, uh, and the two-year transition period, we're now more than a year through, so we're down to about 10 months worth uh, to the point at which it applies. The point at which it applies is the point at which you have to be doing what GDPR requires of you. It's not the point after which you have to do things, it's the point at which things have to be like that. And that particularly applies to the contractual relationships that are in place between controllers and processors and the lawful basis or the legality uh, of the processing of any personal data that you as an organization might have. So the uh, regulation uh, defines controller very simply as the entity which determines the purposes and means of processing. And the processor is a third party to whom a controller uh, outsources part of that processing. Obviously, controllers in many instances will do much of their own processing themselves. So uh, the definition of a processor is not relevant because a processor is a third party to whom a controller uh, outsources some of its processing. And as you'll see uh, shortly, processors are under specific obligations and can only operate within a very specific uh, legal framework. The rights of individuals uh, really are about the right to uh, be able to access and a number of other components, uh, their data, um, the right to their data being protected, the right to the systems within which their data is held uh, being protected, uh, and the uh, expectation that organizations processing their data will, having carried out a risk assessment, adopt appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that the data is secure. And the definition of personal data is a key definition. Uh, there are four or five critical definitions. Personal data is any information relating to identified or identifiable natural person, otherwise known as a data subject. So legal persons like uh, companies are outside the scope of GDPR, uh, and a natural person is somebody who's also defined as being alive. So the data of people who have uh, died or deceased is not subject to uh, GDPR. And the definition of personal data extends to any item or elements by which a person can be identified. So it includes uh, usernames, it includes uh, biometric, genetic uh, information, it includes potentially location data, it certainly includes uh, IP addresses. All of those enable a person to be identified and so they fall within the definition of personal data. So that's the first of the critical definitions. The second is the one of controller, uh, which as I indicated is the uh, entity that determines the purposes and means of processing. And it's worth noting that a controller can be either a natural or a legal person. If an individual uh, operates in a way that they uh, collect data uh, for a wide number of other people, it's quite possible that the individual may also be a data controller. Data controllers are not simply uh, legal personalities. It's whatever the entity, legal or natural, that's determining the purposes and means of processing. There is a derogation in GDPR, which in effect says that uh, data which an individual gathers for their own purely personal use is outside the scope of GDPR. So you don't have to act as a GDPR in relation, for instance, to uh, information you might collect about your friends and uh, family, which uh, is, of course, something of a relief. A processor is the natural legal person that processes personal data on behalf of a controller. Uh, defined uh, in Article 4, Clause 8, uh, for the first time legally, uh, Quite critical, therefore, in thinking about any relationship between your party and any others that involve the uh, movement of data or access to data, that you're clear as to whether you're a controller or a processor in relation to that data, because in either role, you have very specific obligations. And one of the things that you need to be sure of is that you're not uh, a processor and you think you're a controller or vice versa because if the reality is that you're a processor but you think you're a controller and you therefore don't have a contract for processing the data, um, you're in breach of the law and ignorance of the law uh, for GDPR like most other laws is not a normally accepted excuse. <laughs> 
The fourth of the key definitions is the definition of processing. The other key definition, of course, is what is a data breach. But processing in Article 4 is any operation or set of operations performed upon personal data uh, of any sort. And that means automated. Uh, it means uh, by individuals. It means retrieval, consultation, disclosure of, transmission, taking a look at, um, erasing or destroying data. All of those things fall within the classification of personal data. So making a set of records available to somebody to look at a uh, sheet of paper, the fact that they can look at the sheet of paper is, is enabling that person to process that data, letting somebody outside the uh, European Union look at data or about, look at personal data that you've gathered on their screen, even though they're doing nothing else to it, uh, is still classified as processing of the data. So it's a very, very broad uh, definition and one you need to take into account to make sure when you look at all of your relations, all of your personal data movements, that you're considering whether or not it's being processed in terms of this definition. So let's talk more about the obligations and responsibilities of controllers and processors. So the first is the role of data controllers. Data subjects give their data to data controllers, not to data processors. Processors get personal data under a contract with a controller. So it's a controller that has to determine what the legal basis is of collecting data. And Article 5 of GDPR sets out a number of legal bases, only one of which is consent. Uh, consent in many cases is the least best uh, uh, basis of consent because a basis of lawful processing because consent once given can be withdrawn, it triggers a number of other rights. Uh, and uh, while under some certain circumstances, it's the only possible basis of consent, it's the least best one that you can use. So the controller has to determine what the legal basis is for collecting data, has to decide exactly what data to collect having decided what data to collect for each of those elements of data has to decide what the lawful basis is. So collecting information, for instance, about the name and address of a consumer, the lawful basis of doing that might be uh, in order to enter into a contract with them. Uh, collecting details about their uh, bank account might be in order to uh, fulfill a contract uh, with them. Uh, and you need to be clear for each of the different types of data what the lawful basis is, and you'll need to address what the purposes of that uh, collection of data is, how you're going to use it, who you might disclose it to, and you have to put in place a mechanism to enable data subjects to exercise their rights in regard to each of those elements of data. They should be able to access it. They should be able to withdraw consent at a granular level if consent is the basis uh, on which you're processing it. Uh, if consent is not the basis, there are other grounds on which the data subject might be able to object to continued processing. And you need to have made sure that in uh, putting in the processes you put in place to deal with that data, you've made appropriate arrangements to enable data subjects to exercise all of those rights. You also have to determine how long you're going to keep the data, uh, and different elements of data may have different retention periods. Information necessary to enter into a contract you might keep uh, for the period dictated by uh, contract law for information kept in order to uh, prove to uh, HMRC that uh, you've collected the right amount of VAT, the appropriate basis might be VAT records requirements. So a specific retention schedule in relation to each of the elements of data. And of course, if you are talking to a processor, you're going to have to pass those requirements on to the processor. So the controller is the organization having determined what data to uh, collect the means and purposes of processing has to put in place appropriate data protection policies and procedures which will drive the technical and organizational measures that will actually protect the organization. GDPR is very specific in saying that uh, controllers must have data protection policies, uh, having created them must carry them out. And this starts talking to the notion of embedding data protection by design and by default, embedding accountability in the processing operations of the organization. Having carried out a risk assessment, controllers are 
required to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to protect the personal data that they've gathered. And those appropriate measures are not just information security controls, they are um, data subject access request processes, for instance, their um, privacy uh, notices, they're all the things that enable you to demonstrate that you've taken the steps required by GDPR to protect the rights and freedoms of natural persons. And when you're thinking about protecting data, personal data, actually what you're really doing in the words of the GDPR is protecting the rights and freedoms of those natural persons whose data you have collected. You can use codes of conduct. GDPR specifically provides for you to use codes of conduct and international or national standards to demonstrate compliance. They won't necessarily prove that you're compliant, but they can be used to demonstrate that you've applied known best practice to get yourself into a properly compliant status. There are currently only limited numbers of codes of practice uh, and standards available, but uh, the regulators, supervisory authorities, information commissioner publish codes of practice. Uh, there are no real codes of conduct that might be applicable, lots of codes of practice. There are uh, national and international standards beginning to emerge. And while GDPR provides for this to be a key area, the reality is that the universe of um, standards and frameworks to which you can turn is currently quite small. So the processor is carrying out processing on behalf of a controller, remembering that the controller is the entity that determines the means and purposes of processing. If the means includes a third party, then the controller has to, by law, have a contract with the processor. Uh, the processor by law can only process data on the documented instructions of the controller uh, and must take steps to ensure that those people who are processing it will be uh, will observe confidentiality, that the processor also takes appropriate security measures. Uh, all of this driven by the controller. The controller has to be in a position to say to a processor, you have to implement the following controls, or it might be able to say, uh, as long as you achieve the following levels of security, you can select the controls that you adapt. There are a number of ways controllers can identify that, but the key thing controllers have to be aware of is that if there is a data breach at the processor, it's the controller that will be on the hook. So the processor is also required to uh, assist the controller by putting in place appropriate technical and organizational measures to secure personal data, to assist the controller in complying with GDPR uh, requirements, uh, and at the end of the contract has to return all data to the uh, controller and at the same time has to do whatever the controller might need uh, to help the controller demonstrate compliance to the regulation. So processor has a number of very key activities. Very important, therefore, to think about in every one of your relationships, are we a processor? If so, do we have a contract? Uh, if we have a contract, does it set out what we're meant to be doing? Does it uh, set out clearly uh, how we return data? And are we actually doing all of those things? If you think you're a controller and you've passed data to a third party, you need to make sure that as a controller, you've got a contract in place with that third party. Otherwise, you will have passed data to a third party without having a legal basis for doing so. So the data processor can, as I said, uh, if the controller allows it, uh, may provide a uh, room for the processor. If the processor is being asked to collect data, for instance, on behalf of the uh, controller, that's a perfectly legal thing to do. The controller may allow the processor room within which they make those kinds of decisions, but none of that changes the obligation on the controller to ensure that the rights and freedoms of natural persons are uh, protected in compliance with the requirements of GDPR. And the Protection really comes down to, in uh, at the heart of GDPR, the application of the six data protection principles. The six data protection principles start with the requirement that personal data should be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. And then secondly says, should be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes. I have to say that if you can get, I think that if you can get the second principle quite clear, uh, it makes, compliance with the other five uh, really very straightforward. If you're very specific about what you're collecting each element of data for, you're explicit in setting out 
what is required for and making that clear to the data subjects and you're clear that the purposes in every instance are legitimate, then it's very straightforward to comply with principles uh, one, three, four, five, and six. Above all, in thinking about that compliance, GDPR says the controller, stress the controller is responsible for and must be able to demonstrate compliance with the requirement for accountability. And the requirement for accountability is that uh, the organization, the entity must in all parts of the organization embed data processing data protection by design and by default and be able to demonstrate that as an organization it accepts that it's accountable for protecting personal data in line with the requirements of GDPR. I can't see how that can be done without a board and top management down uh, approach and framework uh, within the controller extended through a processing ecosystem to ensure that personal data is dealt with appropriately. So the six data protection principles are the uh, first set of key areas that a controller has to pay attention to. The second are the uh, data subjects rights and article 12 says very clearly that the controller must facilitate the exercise of data subject rights and supporting recitals all make clear that uh, facilitate means do whatever you can to enable them to access, uh, to exercise their rights. You're not allowed to refuse unless you're unable to identify the fact that the data subject is who they claim to be. Uh, refusing to uh, help a data subject access their rights is going to be a breach in itself. So facilitating the exercise of the rights to be informed. They're entitled to know what data you're collecting and what you're using it for. And the privacy notice that you send out uh, needs to follow very clearly the requirements of either Article 13 or Article 14 of GDPR. Article 13 applies to privacy notices that are going to individuals whose data you as a controller have collected directly. Article 14 privacy notices are going to uh, in individuals whose data you've collected from a third party, uh, you might have collected from social media, wherever it is, but it hasn't come directly from the data subject. The privacy notices uh, in each instance are very uh, detailed in terms of setting out uh, what data you've gathered, the lawful basis and so on. That privacy notice also has to contain the data subjects rights and information about how they can exercise their right of access, their right to find out actually what you are doing with their data and does it conform to what you told them in the privacy notice, the rights to have corrected anything which is uh, inaccurate, the rights to have data erased and this is not an absolute right, it's also known as the right to be forgotten, not an absolute right. Uh, you can, for instance, if you can identify an alternative lawful basis to continue processing that overrides this right, continue processing. And for instance, the fact that you have to keep um, uh, records to prove that you've paid national insurance and employee tax for a given period of time would entitle you to override that set of records, even if a ex-employee exercises their right to erasure of some data, assuming that uh, they're talking either about data to which they've, to the processing of which they've consented or data for the processing of which there is no longer a need. Where there is an argument over the accuracy or otherwise of data, the data subject's got a right to restrict your processing of it until such time as the issue is ironed out. And again, under limited circumstances, the second new right is the right to uh, data portability. So the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten, the right to data portability. And this again is a limited right. Uh, it applies only to data which the data subject has given you themselves, uh, where the processing is on the basis of consent, uh, and they've given it to you in machine readable format. They're then entitled to get it from you in machine readable format uh, and to uh, share it with anybody else or to have you send it on to somebody else. Where the lawful basis of processing is something other than consent, uh, they've generally got the right to object to the processing. They've also got rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling, which as a minimum uh, include the right to know that that's what's happening and what the likely consequences will be. So 
uh, very specific uh, eight rights. Uh, your privacy notice needs to list them, needs to set out clearly to the data subject how they go about exercising each of those rights. And your uh, website or other uh, support tools need to make it possible for data subjects to do exactly that. Article 30 requires controllers and processors to maintain records of processing. And these are records which you can't really create at the point when you're undergoing an investigation because they should have been created from the outset and the records start with who you are, what processing you're doing. So you need to determine across all of the processes that you have operating, which ones involve personal data, what types of personal data you're collecting, uh, what you're planning to do with it, why you're doing it, uh, who might get to see the data, uh, if you're transferring data internationally, how you're putting in place and demonstrating you've put in place appropriate safeguards for that data, when the different data categories, uh, what the retention schedule looks like, and what technical and organizational security measures you have implemented. So it's a pretty significant chunk of documentation that uh, you need to create and then update the uh, records of processing will continue to include, for instance, uh, logs, log files, processing information, records of dealing with data subject access requests. All of those are records of your processing activities. And the requirement is that a controller maintains that record. If the controller is based outside of the uh, European Union, rather like uh, Britain uh, will be after Brexit becomes effective, then the controller has to appoint, if you're providing services into the European Union, a representative inside the European Union, and the representative has to, in relation to the processing, maintain those records. So, fairly significant uh, requirements on controllers and processors. Uh, re significant uh, emphasis on controllers selecting processes carefully, recognizing that it's the controller who's on the hook when there is a breach. It's worthwhile then looking at what happens when there is a breach. And the starting point for that is the fifth important definition, which is what is a personal data breach. And GDPR says that a personal data breach is any compromise accidental or unlawful of the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of personal data. Unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of access to data, whether it's at rest or in flight. So if you think about the impact of the WannaCry uh, virus uh, a month or two ago, uh, a number of organizations came out and says the good news is we didn't have a data breach, even though uh, their systems were offline for a number of days. Uh, patients had operations canceled uh, because uh, surgeons and hospital staff were unable to access records. That would count under GDPR as a personal data breach. Uh, the rights and freedoms of data subjects were quite clearly compromised uh, because the data subject was subjects unable to have operations, unable to access treatment that they would have expected to uh, access as a result of their information being within the system. So compromises of confidentiality, integrity, or availability are all data breaches under GDPR. So what happens if there is a data breach? Well, if the controller has a contract with a processor and there's a breach of the processor, the processor is required to notify the controller without undue delay. I can't tell you yet what without undue delay means. We're waiting for um, the um, uh, working party to tell us that, but you should assume that it's pretty well as quickly as possible. Uh, not in a couple of days time, but as soon as you know, you need to be talking to the controller. Certainly one of the practical uh, aspects of any controller processor contract should set out exactly how the processor is required to report data breaches, who to, what the steps are, what type of information has to be provided, how to deal with that out of hours, all of that should be part of the controller processor contract. It's worth noting that GDPR anyway says there are no exemptions. So even if the processor happens to uh, delete 50 records, uh, which it's able to recover a couple of hours later and doesn't think there's been a risk to the data subjects, GDPR says all breaches have to be reported to controllers. 
I've no idea whether over time we'll see some practical de minimum, de minimis uh, uh, rule emerge, but as GDPR is written, it says the processor has to report all breaches without exception to the controller. The controller has to notify the regulatory authority in the UK, the information commissioner, also without undue delay and not later than 72 hours. So that clause suggests that without undue delay probably means something less than 72 hours if that's the maximum. 72 hours is calendar hours, not business hours. So if you have a breach on a Friday, which is typically when attackers strike, knowing that the IT teams will try and take Friday afternoon off and um, be hard at work doing something other than uh, the business through the weekend, you've got until Monday morning to report to the information commissioner that you've had a breach. And your report to the information commissioner needs to include information about the uh, nature of the breach, what happened, what are you doing about it, what's the impact on data subjects. Now, it's worth noting two things about this requirement to report a breach. The first is that if the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons, then you don't actually have to report it. One of the ways of being sh pretty sure it doesn't result in a breach is if the data is encrypted. So if a laptop that is encrypted is lost by your processor, the processor has to tell you because they have no exemptions, they have to report all breaches. Um, you, on the other hand, can judge that there is no risk to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects whose data is on that laptop, unless, of course, there was a compromise of the availability of information, which uh, uh, something was unable to happen because it was there. If there was no risk, then you can decide not to report it to the supervisory authority. I think you need to keep a record of the decision, what the basis of the decision was, because sooner or later there will be uh, an audit. It might be in relation to some other breach and the investigation will come back and look at others. And you need to be able to point at a solid audit trail. On the other hand, if the breach is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects, then you also need to tell the data subjects. And you have to tell them without undue delay. Again, I don't know what undue delay means, uh, but I think you have to assume that undue delay means taking account of the risks to their rights and freedoms. So if the data breach involves a lot of payment card data, for instance, the two or three days that a uh, hacker may have with thousands of payment card records might enable them to compromise a lot of organizations. And so without undue delay might be immediately, I, we've had this breach um, and the only mitigating circumstance that might delay how quickly you tell data subjects is the nature of an ongoing investigation. Certainly, the uh, communication with the supervisory authority is essential. Uh, the supervisory authority might override your decision about whether or what, override your decision not, not to communicate or to delay communication. Uh, they're entitled to do that. As I said, you've got uh, exemption from reporting if you've taken appropriate technical and organizational measures. Uh, you've got an exemption from telling data subjects if the high risk won't materialize. Again, document that, or the effort would be disproportionate, in which case you don't need to talk to them directly. Uh, you can simply uh, advertise it on social media so that it's generally available to everybody. The key message here is you need to make sure that data subjects are aware of what has happened and how they can take action to protect themselves. And all of the areas which, as we've been going through the rights and duties of, uh, as we're going through the duties and obligations on controllers and processors, uh, you'll begin to see all of the liabilities that potentially can accrue, and out of liabilities come the potential for penalties. So let's start with uh, the bit that comes before necessary, nor before perhaps a penalty, and that's the rights of data subjects. And the rights of data subjects, apart from the rights they have to be uh, informed, to have access and so on, also include a right to seek a judicial remedy where they think those eight rights have been compromised. And they can seek a judicial remedy, i.e. go to a court uh, where they live or where you're based um, or where you're established, and they can bring an action for material or non-material damage. And the non-material damage is 
you know, simple things like how upset and depressed they were to discover that you were processing their data without their permission, going back over the last 10 years and the sleepless nights they've had ever since they found out uh, about the risks that they've got and their worries about whether their data has ever been compromised. All of that can amount to, particularly if they get a doctor's certificate, um, a evidence of non material damage. And there is a financial compensation that data subjects can get for non-material damage, and it's got no ceiling on it. So data subjects can bring an action. They have a right to compensation. Where the uh, controller is at fault, the controller will pay that compensation. Where the processor is at fault, the controller can pursue the processor, but it's nevertheless the controller where the obligation exists because it's the controller that determines the means and purposes of processing. That then leads into the business of fines. And in addition to data subjects being able to bring actions, uh, supervisory authorities and member states can levy fines. And the law says that fines have to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. So while proportionate means they've got to be proportionate to the size of the crime and to the size of the breach and the size of the organization, you can't hit a um, company that turns over two million pounds with a 20 million euro uh, fine, it has to be proportionate. They also have to be by law dissuasive. So GDPR says dissuasive and However you interpret it, dissuasive must mean they're meant to hurt, they're meant to send a message to transgressors and to other organizations. So that means that they will err on the side of painful rather than on the side of uh, leniency. The fines have to take into account the uh, technical and organizational measures you put in place to protect data and to comply with the requirements of GDPR. In most instances, you should assume that uh, you will have a fine as a result of either a data subject reporting something to the regulator or bringing an action against you, which leads to the regulator discovering that there's an issue, or you having to report a data breach to the regulator, remembering you've got 72 hours to do that. So the regulator gets to know that there's been something which has gone wrong. Typically, there'll be an investigation. Typically, the investigation will look at more than just what the specific issue is. It will look at the underlying uh, processes of the organization, the extent to which the organization has gone to embed data protection by design and by default, the extent to which accountability is demonstrated inside the organization. And the information commissioner has been crystal clear in saying that fines will be based on those kind of measures, not simply on the extent to on the size of the breach itself. Fines can be for lower levels of transgression, so failing to report a breach is a lower level of transgression. Those low levels, there's a tariff in GDPR which says the fine can be up to 2% of global turnover or 10 million euros, whichever is the higher. And for the major breaches and the three key areas where major breaches occur are in the application of the six data protection principles, in facilitating the exercise of data subject rights, and in dealing with transporter data flows. Up those three areas, fines can be up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover, again, whichever is the higher. So if you assume that you're going to be breached, if you assume that you're going to have one or more disgruntled data subjects at some time, you must assume, therefore, logically, that sooner or later you're going to be facing uh, a supervisory uh, investigation, information commissioner investigation, which you must assume, unless you're perfect and very difficult perfection is, that there will be things which the information commissioner will uncover. Article 83 says that before determining the fine, the supervised authority has to take into account the nature, gravity, and duration of any infringement, the intentional or negligent character of the infringement, any steps you've taken to mitigate damage sub suffered by data subjects, and the degree of responsibility, therefore, you have taking account of the technical and organizational measures you've implemented. I think you can read all of that as saying in practical terms that even though you might not be perfect, the fact that you've taken substantial steps to secure data, to protect it, to comply with GDPR will all count in your favor to the point where you may be able to keep fines down to a very small level. Certainly, you don't want to be in a position uh, where you're breached and you're saying, yeah, we didn't think we would be breached, so 
yeah, we've been caught because then the fine is going to be very substantial. The, we didn't think we would be breached, so we haven't done anything about it, indicates uh, certainly on the best interpretation, negligence um, probably even goes further and, and indicates a deliberate uh, failure to obey the law. And remember, uh, app like lack of knowledge is not considered a legal excuse. That article 82 right to compensation, uh, we talked about the right to financial compensation for material and non-material damage, which the controller uh, is going to be liable for. The process was liable only where the breach has come about as a result of what they specifically have done. They've acted contrarily to the lawful instructions of the data controller. So if the breach has happened uh, at the processor, but they've done exactly what the controller said they should do, uh, then the process is likely to be able to avoid a fine and the controller will have to uh, carry the whole load of it. Where the processor is genuinely at fault while the controller might be uh, on the hook, the controller has a right to claw back uh, against the, uh, the processor. This area, Article 82, is one in which I'm sure there will be uh, law findings and court actions and battles for years to come, and exactly how this works will become clearer and clearer. The issue in the short term is how do you ensure that, uh, that you're not caught by, uh, by a breach? Finally, I said we'd look at the appointment of joint controllers and the issues around subcontracting uh, and uh, recognizing that there are circumstances under which two organizations might jointly determine the purposes and means of processing. So we might, for instance, with a partner decide to stage a webinar. Uh, we and the partner might jointly be delivering the webinar. We'd, uh, we and the partner might be joint controllers of the data of those people who uh, register for that joint webinar. We're jointly determining the means and purposes of processing. Uh, we have a joint liability. Uh, the working party, uh, Article Working Party 29 says that the, um, uh, the way in which joint controllers should deal with that is by having one of the establishments to deal with uh, what the joint controllers have said so that it's very straightforward for data subjects to be able to follow through on the exercise of their rights. So all of this is going to make uh, the business of joint activity a little bit more complex, a little bit more difficult, uh, particularly in the area of marketing than it used to be. Joint controllers have to transparently determine how they're allocating responsibilities between the two of them for compliance with GDPR. As I said, a point of contact for data subjects so the data subjects can easily exercise their rights. And the joint controllers have to work out who is going to provide the data subjects access their information. And access to information includes where has the data gone, who else has seen the data, and possibly where um, the data which might not have come directly from the data subject where that has gone as well. So significant obligations on um, joint controllers, they have to do it by uh, joint arrangement and that arrangement has to be made clear to the data subjects. The data subject can say how are you guys doing this and are entitled to find out. Joint controllers are jointly and severally or jointly and individually liable. So if one of the controllers um, tries to avoid its obligations, action can be brought against the other, even if it's the first that is the one that's led to the data breach. Joint controllers can be exempt from liability if it can prove that it had no responsibility for the data breach. So again, the need for clear definition and uh, differentiation between the activities of joint controllers will become clear. And this is going to be a challenging area, as I said, because marketing teams typically are not that hot at compliance, uh, but it may be that many of the data subjects whose data is gathered by marketing teams will be quite hot on compliance. And so there is a, an area here which can uh, lead to a lot of friction. I said, if you remember, that data controllers not in the European Union, same thing applies to processes not established in the Union, must designate a representative in the, in the Union. And that applies to controllers or processes outside the EU who are providing services into the EU um, or who are, frankly, um, receiving data from uh, organizations in the European Union because you're providing services, therefore, by definition, into it. Uh, 
So the representative should be in the European Union, has to be mandated to be addressed by supervisory authorities and by data subjects. Uh, and the fact that you've designated a representative there obviously doesn't absolve you from your legal obligations to comply with GDPR. So the role of controllers, the how do you go about complying shifts from being something which certainly in the UK for a long time has been something you do if you could, if you remember to do it, to being something now which needs to be upfront in your planning, upfront in how you set up anything that involves the collection or processing of personal data. Of course, Finally, a data processor can itself appoint a data processor. There's nothing in GDPR which says a controller appoints a processor and that's the end of the chain. A data processor might choose for reasons of its own to appoint a sub-processor or a sub-sub-processor. In every case, however, there has to be a written agreement between the processor and the sub-processor um, and you can't have that written agreement without the controller's authorization. In other words, the controller, who is the entity, if you remember, who determines the means and purposes of processing, has to agree to a means of processing which involves multiple processes, has to agree to a change in the means of processing if you then decide to appoint a sub-processor. The data subjects are also entitled to know where there is uh, uh, external processing, uh, particularly if that processing is outside the European Union. So controllers have to authorize it and they have to know how they can inform data subjects. The same obligations apply to sub-processors. You can only process data in accordance with uh, the written contract from your processor and in accordance, therefore, with the controller's instructions. You have to maintain records of processing activities. You have to make sure that uh, confidentiality is observed, that only people authorized to see the data can see it. You have appropriate security measures in place. You help the chain of processors and controllers meet their compliance obligations. You return data to them at the end of the processing. All of that is part of what a sub-processor has to be able to do. One of the key challenges in thinking about processors and controllers, of course, is thinking about cloud service providers. And cloud service providers are, uh, in many instances, going to be controllers, and many other instances are going to be processors, and in a number of instances will be neither. They'll simply be providing a platform within which controllers and processors can operate. It's going to be very important in determining uh, what those relationships are and in, in exactly the same way as any single entity is going to have a number of different relationships. So that applies to cloud service providers. So an organization, any organization is going to be a controller, for instance, in relation to its employees. It's the employer who determines what data to gather from employees, what purposes to use it for. So it's a controller in relation to that. But if the organization, if your organization offers payroll services, then the chances are you'll be a processor in relation to the employee data of your customers. You will process that data in accordance with their instructions. So it's perfectly normal that any single entity will have multiple relationships where data is concerned. And you need to examine each of those relationships to determine whether your role in it is as a controller or as a processor or indeed as a sub-processor and make sure you have appropriate documentation in place to do that and make sure you have that all in place before the 25th of May 2018. Remember, GDPR says that you have to comply on that date. It doesn't say start complying on that date. Any data you're processing, you need to have a proper lawful basis to process on that date. So all of your existing databases, all of your existing relationships with processes and controllers, all of that needs to be sorted out before then. So you need to be reviewing contracts between controllers and processors to make sure they're GDPR compliant. We've got materials that can help. There's a pocket guide, which I think is now probably the best-selling book in the world of data protection. There is the implementation manual. Uh, you can buy that from uh, any one of our five uh, web shops. We've got a recently updated set of documentation uh, uh, tools so that you can get GDPR compliance and BS 10,012 compliant documents. Uh, shorten your route to producing a uh, set of appropriate documents for your own organization. There's a gap assessment tool, helpful for somebody who's got a reasonable understanding of GDPR compliance to do and to map uh, compliance and to map your journey towards um, effective compliance. <laughs>
There are training courses which help you prepare for GDPR, the foundation courses appropriate for uh, people across a broader range of uh, subjects, marketing people, sales people, uh, database people, IT folk, people involved in, uh, in creating IT processes, uh, scrum masters, project managers, as well as, of course, information security and IT people. The practitioner courses for those people with more significant roles in uh, data protection. So heads of HR, key HR staff, key IT staff, data protection officers, a set of courses which is ideal for someone who's going to be a data protection officer. For those controllers that have an obligation to carry out data protection impact assessment where you're processing high volumes of uh, personal data or of special categories of data, there is a workshop, a classroom workshop on how to do DPIAs. And there's a substantial range of uh, consultancy services available. We've got a very fast growing consultancy team uh, operating across many countries who can provide support in terms of doing gap analysis, data flow audits, data inventories, helping implement personal uh, information management systems or information security systems, do cyber health checks, and the whole range of things which might be necessary to help you as an organization uh, get yourself ready for uh, GDPR. Well, that brings me to the end of what I was planning to say. We've got uh, left some 10 minutes. So I'm going to turn to questions. Uh, if uh, any of you still have questions which you haven't yet asked, please do feel free. There is a question uh, section in the um, uh, in the GoToWebinar section. Please do put in there any questions which you may have. I'm going to go through them and I'll read the question out and then I'll share with you the um, uh, with the answer to the question. In Scotland, the local authority believe that they are the data controllers for pupil data rather than the schools themselves. How can this be? I think that's a good question to ask of the data of the local authorities. If the entity is the local authority, if it is collecting the data and is telling schools what to do with the data, um, or if it is telling schools what data they have to collect and how to use it, then it's possible that they will be the data controller and the schools will be the data processor, in which case for those elements of data, the schools can only do what the local authority tells them to do with that data. It means that if that's so determined, schools will not be able to collect data directly from uh, parents or pupils other than under the instructions of local authorities. It's legally, technically possible. It doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, the right arrangement in any part of the world. Can a DPO and data controller be one and the same? So uh, the answer to this question is the what used to be called a data controller, which was somebody who had a data controller role inside an organization has ceased to exist. So uh, a data controller is now the entity that uh, determines the means and purposes of processing in relation to a particular process. And data controllers may or may not need to appoint data protection officers depending on uh, whether they fall within the mandatory group, uh, public authority, an organization processing um, high volumes of personal data or sensitive data where those form part of its core activities, um, have a mandatory uh, are required to appoint a data protection officer. Most other organizations will because compliance with GDPR is onerous, difficult, and not having a DPO can be dangerous. And so uh, whether you appoint one on a part-time basis or a DPO as a service basis, all of those are uh, practical questions for data controllers to consider. What would a data controller have to put in place to ensure contacting people from a recruitment CRM was compliant? Well, the first thing you'd have to put in place is a uh, mechanism for ensuring that the data you have on the recruitment database is um, data that you have a lawful basis for processing. And it may be that the simple and practical way of doing that, the most appropriate basis may well be consent uh, as people don't want to be on a uh, recruitment database, there's difficult to imagine any other reason for putting them there. So you need to contact everybody who's on the database and say, uh, we believe that in the past you've consented. Uh, you don't need to re-consent because you did, uh, but here are your rights. Here's a, an Article 13 privacy notice. Here's your uh, rights. This is how you can withdraw consent. This is how you can exercise all the rest of your rights. And if you do that, uh, you will be uh, compliant. Uh, 
Is PayPal a controller or processor? They seem to be a controller because users need PayPal login details and PayPal control their online account information. So an online shop uses PayPal to process payments is both the shop and PayPal a controller. So um, this is uh, slightly more complex. The answer is that insofar as um, PayPal collects information that it's decided it needs in order to determine uh, your credit worthiness, in order to determine how to move money between the accounts of its customers, it's a controller. It's decided what data it has to have. It's decided how long it will keep it for and what use to put it to. So it's certainly a controller. Insofar as the uh, shop is concerned, an online shop is a controller in relation to the data it gathers up to the point at which the, um, uh, the data subject moves from the web shop to PayPal. PayPal is a uh, separate entity. It's a cloud service provider is probably what you would call it. And the relationship between the shopping basket or the e-commerce business and PayPal is really a controller to controller relationship. And there should therefore be some form of contract in place between and PayPal, one would uh, expect to see emerging from PayPal, a very simple statement of how their obligation for data um, uh, is dealt with. What about data that's already in the public domain? Can you reuse this data for public purposes? Uh, data in the public domain doesn't mean that you can use it. It's in the public domain, but it might have been made public because the data subject desired to do something which didn't include you using it or was published by somebody pursuant to an objective which didn't include you using it. The fact is it is in the public domain. So yes, there is nothing stopping you from collecting the data and using it other than before you use it, you have to contact the data subjects and give them an Article 14 um, uh, privacy notice. An Article 14 privacy notice is one that applies to data not gathered from data subjects. Uh, tells them where you got the data from, what you're planning to use it for, what your lawful basis of processing is. Um, and that lawful basis could vary depending on where you find the data and um, how you, what the legitimate purposes of using the data is. Marketing is a legitimate purpose. Uh, it doesn't necessarily give you a, um, a lawful basis for processing, but in many instances, legitimate is, marketing is identified as a legitimate purpose. And so you give them a, uh, privacy notice, uh, you, uh, once you've done that, you can get on with processing the data um, as long as it's easy for them to exercise their rights. As an enforcement agent for councils, how do we balance our role against the data subject's rights? Well, um, the GDPR is a regulation which says that the data subject's rights are paramount unless there is some other overriding uh, legal or regulatory requirement which has uh, greater importance than protecting data subject's rights. And so the simple answer uh, that I have to give you is that it will depend on exactly what the circumstances are. It will depend on uh, the granularity over which granularity of data over which you're exercising uh, authority. And I would say that in each instance, uh, in terms of category of, of action, talking to the local authorities, uh, solicitors is going to be quite a smart move and get very clear guidance um, in place. What are processors obligations with regards to these six principles? Well, uh, the obligation on controllers and processors is, uh, as with is, is to comply with the six data protection principles. The processor has to comply with the requirements of the controller as set out in a contract and has to exercise the controller in the, ex, in the carrying out of their legal obligation. So if you have a controller who in their contract tells you you only need to comply with four of the six uh, principles, uh, your obligation to help them comply should lead you to go back and say, uh -uh, not so fast. There are six principles. We also are required by law to look after the security of data. You are required by law to look after the security of data, um, and I'm required to help you do that. So again, there will be a conversation. And if a controller insists on giving you something to do that you think is wrong, you either turn it down or you seek an absolute indemnity, uh, legally valid indemnity, which depending on your view about the creditworthiness of the controller might be supported by a sum of money 
um, held uh, on deposit somewhere uh, that will protect you from actions brought against you. We don't return all the personal data to the controllers. We need to retain it in the event of litigation. We currently keep this information for six years. How does that work with GDPR? Uh, and again, the answer is your requirement is to uh, maintain, your requirement is that you don't hold data longer than is necessary for the purpose for which you collected it, other than if there is an overriding um, uh, alternative basis for keeping it. Uh, if you can identify a statutory or court basis that says you have to keep records for a period of time in order to deal with possible court cases, uh, then you've got an overriding uh, basis for retaining the data. But again, uh, this is one of those areas where you want to get very specific guidance from the council's uh, legal professionals. I'm afraid we're running out of time, folks. I can see that there are lots of unanswered questions. Um, I'm going to answer just one more, uh, and then um, we're going to, um, uh, what we'll do is we'll pick up all the remaining questions, we'll make sure they get answered, um, and uh, we'll include those. It'll take about a week or 10 days for all of them to be uh, made, made available to, uh, to everybody. Um, our controllers, let me take this as the final question. Our controller uses our web-based systems to quote or sell a product. Does the privacy notice need to be available at the point of quotation or sale? The privacy notice needs to be available at the point of first processing personal data. And if the first point of contact with a customer is when they give you information that enables you to give them a quote or sell a product. That's the point at which the privacy notice in all its Article 13 glory needs to be available to the data subject. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. As I said, both the uh, slides and the recording of the webinar will be available quite soon. Answers to all the rest of the questions will be available, uh, although that will probably take about a week or 10 days before they've gone through our internal uh, processes. Thank you all for uh, joining the webinar. There are others coming up. Please do feel free to uh, draw on the wide range of both uh, commercially available and freely available resources which we have for you. Thank you and have a good afternoon.